Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Alberto Piagesi. I am the president of the European Wound Management Association and the director of the Diabetic Food Session in Pisa University Hospital in Italy. And I'm pleased to introduce to this human webinar, which is devoted to the evolution of the management of the diabetic food syndrome. Please let me introduce to you today's speakers, uh, which are Dr. Bijana Najafi, uh, which is professor of surgery and director of the clinical research in the division of vascular surgery and endovascular therapy at the Bilder College of Medicine in the US, and which will talk about the role of telemedicine and new technologies in the management of diabetic food syndrome. And Patricia Price, which is the professor of burn injury research in the Center of Global Burn Injury Policy and Research at the Swansea University and Emeritus Professor at Cardiff University in UK. Patricia will talk about the patient involvement in the prevention and treatment of the diabetic foot syndrome. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, I will speak about the new clinical evidence and how did it change the management of diabetic foot syndrome. This, is, this webinar is part of the uh, Yuma webinar initiative, which is been which has been conceived and uh, realized for uh, promoting um, a, a continuous contact between uh, Yuma and his uh, members and his partners uh, to continue and to um, improve possibly the quality of communication around uh, around um, uh, wound themes and wound management. Um, today's webinar is also important because uh, we'll uh, uh, introduce the uh, diabetic foot uh, 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 grants, uh, diabetic foot observation grants, uh, which uh, has been uh, um, uh, realized and um, promoted by UMA with the unconditioned support of Urgo, Laboratoire Urgo which uh, uh, generously uh, um, uh, allow uh, Yuma to um, devolve uh, 10,000 euros for uh, the early in career uh, researcher and 10,000 euros for, thank you, <coughs> for um, senior career professional uh, on uh, the subjects related to diabetic foot ulceration. Uh, this is not the first time that these uh, awards uh, have been uh, promoted and realized by Yuma, uh, and uh, in the in the uh, but it's the first time that these are focused on diabetic foot ulceration, uh, which is uh, the subject also of this topic. And for this, we are very happy that Urgo accepted and, and I would say very uh, very enthusiastically accepted to support this initiative. And the, uh, I was saying that uh, this is the second time that these awards are uh, have been um, realized. Uh, last year, uh, the awards uh, uh, have been um, <clears throat> uh, promoted as well, and the, the results will be um, uh, announced and presented at the next uh, um, London Congress in in uh, November 2020. Let me spend uh, only one word about this uh, uh, this new congress that Yuma is going to deliver in London because it will be the first one which uh, will be virtual. Uh, uh, we um, are trying. We are still uh, in the in the in the mood of uh, training on on this, but it will be the first uh, ever Yuma virtual congress. And possibly one of the first uh, big congresses that uh, in the world uh, will be delivered uh, completely on virtual um, on virtual aspects. So uh, you can uh, uh, get all the information you need uh, on the human website. I invite all of you to uh, to go there and uh, and have. Uh, um, uh, uh, and experience what this uh, uh, this congress will be, but uh, uh, we are trying to make uh, this experience as unique and worldwide uh, worldwide um, experience. 
So, um, said that, uh, I will uh, start right away my uh, presentation, my part of the webinar, uh, which will be uh, divided in three parts of 10 minutes each, with uh, a final part of uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, in which uh, uh, questions uh, and, uh, can, be, uh, can be asked by <clears throat> uh, the chat box that uh, you will uh, find on your uh, on your uh, uh, in, on your uh, panel uh, on your control panel on on the right side of, of the screen, and uh, we will be able to we will be able to uh, answer at the end of this of this way. So my my task is uh, to give you some uh, uh, clues, some information on how uh, diabetic food uh, uh, has uh, changed from um, 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 uh, a local pathology to a syndrome, and uh, how, how, this, uh, how uh, innovations and novelties have been produced to change our, <coughs> our, um, uh, our possibility of caring about the syndrome, especially uh, on the management of the assertive part of it. So, uh, the food syndrome, we know that more than uh, 100 million people in the world are affected by the syndrome, and that uh, uh, every 20 seconds a lower limb is lost because of diabetic food syndrome. And uh, it bears a mortality which is similar to many forms of cancer, and also uh, it uh, accounts for the consumption of resources which is second to now for among those related to diabetes, <clears throat> but also it's still largely underestimated and I would say poorly known by uh, both uh, uh, medics and uh, patients. Why a syndrome? Why diabetic foot can be considered a syndrome? Because uh, around the, the core of this pathology that we know is originated from diabetes through the contemporary activity of different concoses like uh, neuropathy and uh, arteriopathy and infection, which determines an ulcerative pathology that frequently evolve uh, towards amputation. Around this core, uh, the patients have a number of comorbidities which uh, characterize a fragile condition, a frail condition, which uh, um, uh, um, stands together with the core pathology conditioning the evolution towards a uh, much uh, more um, uh, worsening situations that put the patient at risk not only of losing the limb but also of losing the life. As, as we know, this pathology is also uh, an evolutive pathology. This syndrome is something that not only uh, affects patients once but is a very likely to recur as this paper on New England Journal of Medicine um, focus on <clears throat> a meta-analysis of the study that uh, um, have been produced on the recurrences of, uh, of the active phases of diabetic foot syndrome uh, tells us that uh, it's only a matter of time but more or less you have to expect that all your patients will possibly uh, recur in 10 years. So if you wait uh, as much as 10 years, you will have almost 100% of recurrences. And I would say not recur, but worsen, evolve, progress towards worsen situ worse situations, which uh, uh, ends very frequently in, in, with a bad prognosis. And in this situation, ulcers still represents a, a, a pivotal point since it is the responsible for the vast majority of amputation since uh, almost uh, more than 85 percent of the amputation are caused by are preceded by an ulcer but also uh, uh, is uh, uh, um, related uh, with uh, a mortality uh, uh, that is very high uh, you see that in this um, paper 40 Five percent uh, the mortality at five years when you have a neuropathic ulceration, fifty-five percent the mortality 
at five years if you have an ischemic ulceration. So ulcer is important, is a, is a sort of pivotal point in the pathology which transform a chronic patient in an acute recurrent invention um, exposed to uh, uh, complications. When we are speaking of ulcers, we have a, a different, uh, uh, a different kind of ulcers that can be uh, in, in, uh, classified clinically uh, uh, between uh, um, uh, neuropathic ulceration, which there is not a significant um, ischemic uh, uh, component, and in which offloading and control of infection are effective for um, stopping the, the evolution of the process and healing the ulceration. But also we have uh, ischemic ulceration, in which revascularization is able and uh, effective in uh, uh, restoring a normal circulation and together with the other means, therapeutic means, uh, solve the situation. But also we have an, a new ischemic ulceration in which we have uh, uh, a, a mixing of uh, neuropathy and ischemia to participate to the, <clears throat> to the uh, pathology of the, of the ulcer. In this uh, gray zone, um, ischemia is not enough uh, important to, um, to uh, deserve a revascularization, but still condition, it's, it's enough to condition the evolution of the lesion. And the numbers of these, uh, uh, these ulcers are important also because uh, they are not only generated by the evolution of neuropathic ulceration towards ischemia, but also because the ischemic ulceration, because of revascularization, are transformed in new ischemic uh, with mild ischemia ulceration. So we have some 50% of our patients suffering of this condition. And this condition is uh, extremely difficult to be treated because as the, in the in the previous uh, <clears throat> edition of the international guidelines is clearly stated, there was up to now no evidence of treatments specific for this kind of situation in which offloading is not enough, control of infection is not enough, but still there, is, there are not indication for revascularization. So up to now we were in the gray zone also in the therapeutic uh, area, but Fortunately, in the last years, some studies came uh, giving us some clues for treating this, uh, uh, this pathology. And uh, uh, I will mention to you, uh, because we need some information to fill this gap, this gap in local care of this kind of situation. Uh, the first study that we will mention is the Explorer study, which has been published in Lancet, on Lancet in 2017. Let me tell you that this is the first time that a, a study on the management of diabetic foot ulceration is published on such a reputed uh, scientific journal. This study, which uh, um, is uh, related to the vast population of new ischemic well, well characterized ulceration using uh, a local dressing with sucrose octasulfate, demonstrated how this. Uh, compared to uh, standard therapy, to um, high qualified standard therapy inserted in a, in a multi-disciplinary uh, and multi-component uh, approach, uh, improved the rate of healing of 18%, reducing the healing time of two months. So an extremely interesting result. And you can see that all the subsidiary items that uh, compose the secondary, <coughs> secondary uh, outcome were positively uh, affected by using this uh, new, no, this novel dressing. This was the first time that uh, we had such a solid evidence that the local dressing was able, and off the shelf of uh, uh, local dressing was able to change the fate of this kind of oscillation. Let me uh, continue to the second uh, study that as well was published on, on Lancet one year later, a study on the Leucopatch system of the same model of uh, ulceration. And uh, this study was, was uh, a different approach in which uh, uh, peripheral blood sampling was uh, processed with uh, uh, bedside technologies 
and uh, um, produce a patch uh, which was able to be applied to the uh, could be applied bedside to the lesion uh, that you want to treat and that again produced uh, out of uh, of this uh, study results which was very interesting a significant difference that in this case was significant at least <clears throat> also not so important like in the study that I mentioned before, but was a difference of 12% in, in the cohort of patients treated with this approach. Last but not least, a recent, an extremely relevant study uh, from the U US, the other two were from <coughs> Europe, published on diabetes care very recently, in which uh, the application of topical uh, oxygen to the, to the wounds, again the same, the same model of <clears throat> new ischemic wound produce an important difference again in healing rates, uh, which was uh, extremely significant, and uh, which uh, in this uh, uh, later case improved uh, by 28% the rate of healing. So it's very important for us to say that we get this evidence because this is something that uh, changed our approach to the care of this patient difficult to treat. In fact, actually, the, the new edition of the International Working Group Directed Food Guidelines uh, took in consideration this new evidence, promoting the, um, the, 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 the use of these uh, devices, of these technologies, because of the, of the um, uh, existence of the, uh, of the solid evidence behind them. And uh, I can say that this changed the fate of our patients as well, because we were able, we are now able to have not only uh, the, the, the general approach, but also a specific approach to wound care in the neuroscanic photos. So uh, that's all for my, for my part. And uh, I thank you for the attention. And uh, I am happy to give the, the um, um, the speech to Bijan Najapi, which will follow with the uh, new technology in the management of diabetic foot ulceration. Please, Bijan. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Piagesi. It's a true and truly an honor to be to have this opportunity to talk remotely. Nice meeting electronically, everybody. I know that I don't have opportunity to see all, but I'm hoping that during few minutes that I have, I can share some of the technology that can help to uh, manage diabetic foot syndrome, mainly in the uh, current challenges that we are dealing with COVID-19. Feel free to send any question that you may have over text box. Uh, we have several also recent publications around this topic. If you need to have any of those publications, just send me a note and I would be happy to share this publication with you. Um, so this is list of my disclosure. I don't have any particular financial conflict of interest relevant to the topic that I've been covering today. What I'm hoping to cover in the next 10 minutes or so is talk about how to leverage technology and practical digital health technology to remotely manage people who are at risk of diabetic foot syndrome. Um, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic devastated many healthcare systems. It's not just in Italy, UK, Europe, or US. It's everywhere. It's really worldwide. In particular, the COVID-19 pandemic exposes our healthcare systems weaknesses. For instance, this outbreak shows that traditional healthcare delivery uh, models for managing chronic illness like diabetes are not at the scale to handle situations like the global COVID-19 crisis because uh, people with diabetes often represent a fragile population. This is recommended to avoid unnecessary diabetes-related clinic visits or hospital admission to reduce the risk of uh, COVID-19 exposure in the hospital. This disrupting the best practices that we know for years for preventing diabetes-related complications, including diabetes foot ulcer. At the same time, um, as healthcare providers searching for alternatives to deliver timely care to patients with diabetes foot syndrome, it is tempting to imagine a post-COVID 
future may lead to some positive changes in healthcare for people with chronic illness, particularly in promoting personal care and preventive care for diabetic foot ulcer. The fact is we have already many technology uh, that can be utilized for those kind of the application. Uh, I, I summarize these technology and I'm hoping that in the rest of the, my talk to talk about some of those technology, I, I divide them in three categories. One category is the technologies that can help us to triage those who need to see in the clinic or can benefit from telemedicine consultation. The second category that I believe is very important is those technology that can empower patients or their caregivers to be part of health ecosystem, to be engaged as a part of the care. And the last segment are remote care technology, the technology that can facilitate delivering care remotely. So let's talk about the first category. There are several technologies that can be used to facilitate triaging those who may at risk of development of food ulcer. Uh, this is like to summarize one of those technology named Smart Mat. Is designed by a company in Boston named Polymetrics. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to be part of the clinical validation of this system. Um, it, it was published actually three years ago. Uh, how it works, it's based on a, a simple mat that is fully wireless uh, and uh, it includes even a cellular uh, chip inside of the mat that helps to transfer whatever is collected to the to the cloud, it doesn't require to have internet or Wi-Fi, so everything is done automatically. Uh, simply, we ask patient to stand on a mat for 20 seconds, and what that mat is does is capture a thermal image of the feet and send this image to the cloud. So to validate this technology, uh, we recruited 129 patients with history of diabetes foot ulcer, um, this was multiple site study. We followed them for 34 weeks. There wasn't any intervention. We, we didn't share this image with the patient or doctors, but of course the patient received usual care. Uh, at the end, we uh, documented 53 diabetic foot ulcer, and then retrospectively, we look at how early we can pick up that foot ulcer and what was the accuracy and uh, sensitivity and specificity. That was done to develop an artificial intelligence method to pick up that with ulcer and triage the patient who would be at high risk. Interestingly, we find out that we can pick up the foot ulcer uh, with 37 days lead time on average and 97 sensitivity. Uh, of course, the specificity was low, it was around 60%. We, that means that we have a lot of false alerts. But that might be okay if you would like to identify that patient as a candidate for telemedicine consultation to prevent diabetic foot ulcer to be happen. It's very promising advance in field of the remote patient monitoring. Uh, another solution that we can think about it is maybe we can add other risk factors to reduce the false alert and better triage those who would be at very high risk and would be good candidate to see in clinic or receive telemedicine consultation. This is a technology that we designed a few years ago. We name it Smart Socks. It's based on fiber optic that by changing the wavelengths of the light, we can measure the parameters like pressure, temperature, and even the range of motion of the big toe. So those are the mechanical risk factors that we know that can contribute on predictive of risk factors. To validate the technology, we recruited 33 patients with diabetic, with all, uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. We use thermal camera as well as uh, an FS scan that is computer's pressure insole that capture the peak pressure on the knee of the foot. And we compare the measurement between these two measurements. And, Actually, you find out that relatively there is a good agreement uh, between these measurements. In other words, we can use the, these kind of technology to capture risk factor remotely and try as in the patient who are at a high risk of the measurement. Uh, now there are actually a commercial product similar to this concept in the market. Uh, this is, for example, one of those technologies is a, is a smart sock designed by a company in San Francisco named Siren Care. Uh, they measure only temperature, not pressure. 
uh, but they use a kind of the smartphone and also cloud to also empower a patient to be part of the care. Um, basically, if the temperature is going up, so they can notify patients to help to reduce the temperature. They, they published the results two years ago, uh, and um, this based of the validation on 35 patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Of course, some of those results, they seem to be too good, like perfect agreement that they find out with the gold standard, so I'm not rely on those results. But what it's really promising about this technology is that we have a very simple way to look at the difference between two identical spots on the foot and seeing that, for example, when we increase in the temperature more than two degrees centigrade uh, difference between the two spots. So those are very rich information that can help to uh, reduce maybe reoccurrence of an ulcer or providing timely care. I'm very excited to see, of course, the validation of these results to see that whether it, it can really help to prevent diabetic foot ulcer. But in point of view, of view of triaging and providing telemedicine consultation, probably that could be a promising technology here. Uh, we have also some promising technology like a smart offloading that can, again, empower a patient to be part of the care. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, for uh, an example of those technologies, smart offloading that designed by partnership between two companies, uh, one company in Italy named Optima and the other one in US in Seattle named Sensorio. What they did, they add a sensor uh, as a part of the offloading. This sensor can automatically detect that whether the patient is wearing this offloading or not. Then using uh, a smartphone as well as a smartwatch, they reinforce adherence. They encourage the patient. If they are doing great, they encourage them. And if they are not doing great, if they are not wearing the offloading, they notify them in real time. And most importantly, they create a very elegant and secure uh, patient portal that is access, uh, accessible through the cloud. That be a very simple color code. You can find out that which patient has a poor adherence or medium adherence or good adherence. So in other words, it can also help to triage those patients that may benefit from telemedicine consultation to hopefully improve adherence of, of, the, pa uh, of the patient to the offloading device. Uh, I'm not aware about any clinical validation of this technology. I know that some clinical evaluation is ongoing, but this is very promising advance in this area. Another uh, promising technology uh, is developed by a company in Canada named uh, Orpex. They design a smart insole and a smart watch. What it does, this uh, insole detects the sustained pressure, the pressure that lasts, for example, more than 15 minutes, and then notify through the smart watch when this pressure is happening. And then through a simple guiding of the patient, they guide them how to reduce that pressure. For example, if the pressure is because of prolonged standing, it recommend the patient to have a few steps. Uh, then uh, if it's sauce and pressure, it might be because of callus, they recommend to check their feet, whether they see some redness, whether they have any foreign object inside the shoes. So basically the patient can start to caring on, on, uh, on their feet and be a part of this study. The results recently published by a group uh, from Manchester, published in Lancet Digital Health. Uh, they recruited 90 patients with history of diabetes with ulcer. They followed them for 18 months. That was randomized control trial. Of course, unfortunately, they have a lot of dropouts. Approximately 35% of the patients drop out from the study. But for the remaining uh, participants, the results were really impressive. So they, they find out that the intervention group, uh, they have 71% reduction in ulcer recurrence compared to the control group. So that's really in, in, uh, promising about empowering technology. I, I know that some other technologies are coming to the market on this level. Uh, finally, in, in point of view of remote care, probably everybody they are hearing about telemedicine and telehealth. Uh, we, we have a systemic review that published in a book uh, published by Dr. Pia Gassi. Uh, I recommend you to read that, uh, that book if you're interested about this topic. Uh, I, I summarize those knowledge about telemedicine on three categories. Those papers that talk about efficacy of telehealth, cost of telehealth, and reliability of telehealth. In point of view of efficacy, probably landmark work coming from group in Finland, uh, from Ramsens, 
uh, they, they, they did randomized control trial, including 401 patients that followed them for one year. The intervention, including of the three cluster of intervention, one visit in clinic and three visits through telemedicine. The control group, they have three visits in clinic. And then they continue this cluster of the tree till the time of the wound healing or uh, if they end up amputation or patient pass away. What they find out, they find out that actually the outcomes are the same between telemedicine group and in clinic visit groups in point of view of healing and the rate of amputation. The rate of mortality was slightly higher in telemedicine group. Um, that's very hard to explain, but we can summarize that Basically, delivering care through telemedicine could be as effective as face-to-face -face through clinic. In point of view of cost, the same group estimated the cost. Uh, what they find out, they find out that on average, we have 41% reduction of the cost in favor of telemedicine, or on average, over a little over 2,000 euro per patient. That was very promising. Of course, these numbers didn't achieve such a significant level in, in their sample. In point of view of uh, efficacy or reliability of telemedicine, like using the image of the wound to do consultation, uh, there are some good study. Uh, probably one of the best one is from Bowling from the University of Manchester. What they did, they have five clinicians, two clinicians, they look at the wounds in person, they grade them, they assess the wounds, and three others they remotely look at the wounds through the image that's shared from a 3D imaging camera. They find out that there is a good agreement between what the doctor seeing the wound actually in the clinic and what they saw remotely. Of course, they have less, less agreements when the patient actually needed to have some debridement. And they link these to some of the limitation of the image to, for example, identify moistness that required to do some, for example, debridement decision making. Of course, there are now some technology that can fill those gaps. Uh, for instance, now there are very impressive development about the smart dressing that can measure some wound characteristic like most, like pH or other parameter that can really uh, combine with telemedicine uh, um, to improve the decision making and decided that whether we need to see the patient in clinic for doing the brightman or providing some care to the patient. Uh, there are also some promising technology in area of, of the voice-enabled uh, technology like Siri and Alexa. Uh, we published actually a review paper on this one. If somebody is interested, I would be happy to share with that one. But because of the stick of time, I skip that part. But I end my talk uh, with this quote from Bill Gates. And I'm sure that everybody knows him. Um, he said, and I quote, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lured into inaction. The reality is that this pandemic uh, really challenging everybody and that uh, may accelerate the transition of innovation in technology. It's good to become familiar about this technology and be on top of that wave and empower ourselves to utilize those technologies. With that, I end my talk and thank you so much. Thank you, Bijan. It's been really thrilling to see what technology may bring to the quality of our care to our patient. And now it's time and my pleasure to introduce to you Patricia Price, which will see things from another point of view, probably the most important one, which is the the the, the patient point of view, the involvement of the patient in its own care. Please, Patricia. Thank you both very much and um, hello to everyone from Wales, which is part of the UK. Um, as you can see, my talk is slightly different and what I'm going to try and rush through in the next 10 minutes is a very complex issue, which is how do we involve patients in their care? So on this slide, you can see a couple of the key topics that I hope to just give a, a bit of an update on as we follow that theme of how things have evolved over the last um, 10 years, 20 years. But I do want to start by just asking you to put yourself in the position of someone who has been just given that diagnosis of diabetes and knowing that there is now ahead of you this lifelong change in your behaviour. And we're very well aware 
as it's already been mentioned, that the WHO are predicting big numbers in this area and that in many cases it's related to unhealthy lifestyles where we can contribute by changing what we do. Now what we have seen emerge in the last 20 years is the real importance of multidisciplinary teams. Um, everyone has to get involved, lots of different skills to contribute. But where does the patient sit in that is one of the questions I want to ask. I also want you to just spend a few seconds thinking about what we've all been through in terms of, or in some cases still going through for the pandemic. Now I'm not equating these two, but it has been perhaps for some of us the first time we've really been asked to make huge changes to our own behaviour and to do so both quite quickly, consistently, without knowing really how long that's going to last. Many approaches to illness start with public health and we all have been going through that. Um, I think you might recognise the logo that's up there at the moment. Variants of this have come across many countries at the moment about staying safe, where the emphasis is about getting the message across, very simple wording, icons that you will remember. So we're just raising awareness that there's a, a problem or there's an issue. Many of them in areas such as smoking, obesity and alcohol use, just to name a few, often play on a sort of common sense approach. Um, you know, smoking kills you, so stop doing it, that sort of thing. And some of the message that you, that you will see here are ones from the last 30, 40 years that I'm sure you will remember because they were so iconic. Uh, people of my age will remember very well that what's about to come out of that envelope is a message that says AIDS don't die of ignorance. This is another one from obesity, very clear, makes you want to know what's happening, what is it I need to know about this? And of course, messages around don't drink and drive. These are all raising awareness around a topic. But what we do know is that whilst we need to know what we have to do to change, what is it about my behavior I need to change? Education and raising awareness is a necessary first step, but it is not sufficient for people to actually get out there and change what they're doing. And there are whole books on that difference between knowing something and then doing something about it. Now, for many, many years, people will have sought the fantastic and expert help that you get from medics, from nurses, from podiatrists, from nutritionists, from a whole physiotherapist, whole range of health professionals where you go and you want to know what is the matter with me? What must I do about it? And this is a model that has worked incredibly well for acute care. What we are discovering and have known for a little while, but the evidence has been a bit patchy, is that it doesn't work as well for chronic conditions. Just going and seeking information doesn't drive behaviour change. So what we have focused on is a broader approach to education. And I have to admit, having been part of some of these systematic reviews that you can actually see here, it's been a bit disappointing that most of those reviews haven't come out saying, yes, this is going to be the panacea for all things. There is, however, one review of uh, six randomised control trials that started having some significant results. But the information here that's really important to note is that it has to be an intensive programme before it seems to link with clinical outcomes. One of the ones that I was involved with, we also found that the thing that was actually quite important was sticking to a regime, sticking to the advice that you were given. And that was almost more important than what that advice was. So we do know interventions have to be intense, they have to be consistent. It means we've talked about adherence quite a lot in the health professions, but we also know people struggle with being told what to do sticking to advice. And although this particular reference here is about taking your medication, we have to remember that those with diabetic foot ulcers are also managing their diabetes. So over the years, we've moved to something that's more like shared decision making, involving patients in making the decisions about their care. But a few points that I've put at the bottom here 
sometimes it's a bit uncertain when those big decisions are made, not quite being sure how it's going to present in a given patient. And there are also a lot of patients who actually are happy for health professional staff to make those decisions for them. It doesn't suit everybody. But what we do know is that health literacy, how much people know about health generally, is an important factor in predicting whether they are going to be involved in their own care. So what do we need to know? And I think we're moving to a scenario where we just need to know a bit more about the patient's life, their experiences, how much they want to be involved in their own care, and where they can make a good contribution to the team. So recently, we've moved much more to this term called patient-centered care, which is about shared decision-making, but it's much more about making a customized and comprehensive care plan that's for the individual. What do we need to do? Well, I'm sure if you looked at these, you'd say, well, I'm doing all of this already. I communicate. I try to work with individuals in a way that will suit them. But it's about really focusing on involving the patient. But it's also for the patient to start taking some active participation in their own care. And that is actually quite new in terms of really encouraging people to do that. Taking time to find out more information, talking to their family, and making sure that it's okay to ask a health professional if they don't understand. Is this a beneficial? What do we know? Well, you'll be pleased to see that there is a new uh, venture from Yuma that you'll be available, will be available very soon, which is because documents such as position papers are starting to emerge on this important topic. Because although intuitively it seems the right thing to do, we're still searching for that evidence of how to make it work. There's very little information though on cost effectiveness of such studies. Who is going to pay for the extra staff time that will be needed to get patients involved in their care? And not all of the studies we looked at actually related to clinical outcomes. We do know though that patients like being involved when they're given that opportunity. So in conclusion, we don't have a lot of evidence yet. We do know though that this approach takes time, it needs to be personalised, it's got to be intense, consistent, continuous, so it's a lot of effort. But how are we going to afford that? How will we redesign our services to allow that to happen? Now, as you've already heard, the numbers are going up and really we can't afford to get this wrong. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Patricia, for this uh, very interesting and uh, I would say uh, moving um, um, presentation on patients' uh, point, of view, point of view and involvement in care. And uh, I, I encourage, and, uh, and uh, this is something that we uh, um, mix together with the other two um, sections on purpose to um, uh, create a sort of uh, situation in which uh, uh, reflection and, uh, and question possibly should be uh, raised by <clears throat> by the audience and um, I invite all of the attenders or the participants to the webinar to uh, write down their own questions on the uh, on the chat box and I start uh, I open uh, the discussion which uh, uh, we we hope will be uh, soon uh, participated by the attenders asking to you Patricia what do you think uh, uh, could uh, be uh, what the role of uh, um, I would say media and uh, and new media could be in the patient caregiver relationship. We are witnessing, you know, a, a, an increasing of uh, uh, I would say confusion and confusion, confusing messages and uh, inputs in in this relationship. What do you think? I think that's an incredibly important question and very timely because of the rise of misinformation uh, of people searching for uh, ways to help their own situation in by going to perhaps um, the wrong sources. Um, often they are reliant on friends and family who are 
unfortunately not necessarily more informed than they are themselves. So it's trying to use social media in a way that encourages people to go to confirmed resources uh, where there is evidence behind the advice that's been given. On the positive side though, even in the most remote parts of the world which I've worked in, I've been amazed how many people do have access to a smartphone, even in parts of the world where you think other types of technology are not easily available. So they can so well be used for things like prompting to turn up for um, um, a session with a medic or a, a nurse or a practitioner. They can be a timely reminders to prompt you to take your medication, check your feet, go and make sure that you go and stand on your mat, you make sure that you do things. So we have to be clever and I think canny in terms of how we use social media, but also remembering that certainly at present, many of our older patient groups, and I don't mean this by all by any means, but many of them are not happy using um, technology. So we can't only use that as a method of either raising awareness or actually encouraging participation. Um, many uh, have not grown up with it in the same way that we have. Future generations, however, I think will be even more dependent on using it, and we need to be prepared for that. So uh, this this would bring uh, uh, would give room to uh, uh, um, a number of questions coming now from the audience, and uh, I will uh, summarize for you. Um, there are questions from uh, many uh, many uh, many friends there, and I will summarize some of them for you, Bijan. Uh, the sense of many of these questions is well, this is uh, this is uh, fine. This is uh, beautiful and interesting, but how could people from a low-income country or people which have no access, as Patricia said before, to um, um, technology be, uh, um, be treated in, in, in a better situation? Can, uh, uh, I would say, I would add, there are uh, low-profile technologies uh, that can be uh, used in this case? Excellent question. Uh, of course, I'm a tech savvy person. I really love the technology, but I understand that when we are talking about technology, everything may look very expensive and complicated. The reality is that everybody owns a cell phone. Even if you're going to the poor country, they may not have drink cable water, but they have a smartphone. So this is a smartphone has camera. So already you can do telemedicine using those kinds of concepts. Um, this pandemic, as I mentioned, they have a lot of negative consequences, but the reality is, is that now both patient and doctor, they challenge themselves to utilize those technology. We have the patient that now become used to Zoom and through Zoom or Skype, we chat with them. They learn how to share the picture of their wound with us. The doctor also is starting to become used to those kind of the telemedicine aspect. We don't have any other choices to go to that aspect. That change is shifting culture, making the people become used to it, those kind of aspect. And now that we have, for example, United States reimbursement for all the remote patient monitoring, almost every technology they're trying to add this component of the remote patient monitoring and consultation for the doctor. And the doctor now they can finally charge for the time that is spent to look at those data and provide some consultation. That will help to scale up those technology and ultimately reduce the cost. I'm anticipating that in the next few years, all those technology become available. Maybe the sock that you are wearing, it could be smart socks. Maybe the, the, the bath mats that we have in our bathroom, it could be smart. And that that's when it's a scale up, ultimately the reduce could be reduce the cost and ultimately can help also other country with the lower revenue as well. And this, uh, again, we have uh, only a few, few minutes to, to, to the end, unfortunately, but also there are a number of other questions that I might summarize uh, and uh, take all together as, a, as a, I would say, uh, both uh, speakers, for both speakers' comments, uh, 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 short, short comments possibly. Uh, how do you think uh, this uh, uh, COVID pandemic uh, influenced and affected 
and the, 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 um, the um, care of diabetic food patients. Could, uh, on the patient side and the technology side, this situation uh, bring uh, uh, some uh, changes in, in our uh, attitude to interact with these people? I think from the patient point of view, I've certainly seen a range of responses. I've been amazed and fascinated how well clinics have been able to reorganize themselves in order to try to keep going in a situation where people are afraid to go in because they're worried that they're actually going to get COVID. So I think it's it had some amazing creative thinking from people around um, the numbers that can come in, put forward through a section so that there's less contact as possible. However, from the patient point of view, what I have actually picked up is more and more higher levels of anxiety. Uh, and that I think means that they are much more worried uh, about going into a clinic. They're, they are concerned that in missing though that face-to-face, -face, they are missing out on the highest quality care. So there's been quite a bit of education we really have had to do around assuring them that if there's an emergency, we're always there for them. I echo Patricia, it's nicely said. I, I actually just published a letter to editor, published yesterday, Diabetes uh, Journal of Diabetes Science and Technology, uh, um, uh, that I summarize actually my opinion about the post pandemic. The reality is that everybody, of course, they are optimistic that we'll have vaccine coming soon, but the reality is that it may not happen in the next few years. So we need to cope with this condition. And everybody needs to challenge themselves from patient point of view and doctors to see that how we can cope with this kind of condition and, and utilizing maybe a creative way to provide care to the patient. And that is essential. Mental health is essential as well as providing timely care. Uh, I, I personally a little optimistic that finally all of them may come up with a way that finally we touch on preventive care rather than yeah. providing care when it's too late and deliver care to everybody. Thank you. Uh, I am sorry to say we are a little bit over time and uh, I have to uh, close the, the webinar, but I want to reassure all the friends that uh, have been uh, putting question on the chat box that we will uh, uh, reply, respond uh, to them uh, uh, eventually on the website when they can get, uh, when they can get the, uh, the, um, the uh, and um, the registration of this webinar on uh, www.uma.org and uh, you will find the, the, the registration in a few days and we'll, we'll try to address all the questions there. And I thank again uh, Patricia and Bijan for being with us and uh, for uh, giving us uh, their expertise and, uh, and uh, the, um, the point of view on the these uh, very important uh, and uh, uh, challenging questions. And I give you appointment to the next uh, uh, webinar of uh, Yuma uh, on, on, you will find uh, the advertisement in a few days on the Yuma website. Thank you again and have a good day and stay safe. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye.